Hey, it's Sarah Burke here from the Women in Media podcast. And before we get started on a new episode, could I get you to hit like, follow, subscribe, hit the bell, whichever app you do your podcast listening in. Make sure you're all set up so you know when there's a new episode and you can help spread the word. Oh, and if you're so inclined, could I ask you to leave a review if the app that you're using does that? You're the best. All right, let's get to the show. I'm Sarah Burke, and this is the Women in Media podcast. Last episode with Maureen Holloway and Wendy Mesley on the topic of their new podcast, The Women of Ill Repute, I mentioned I'd be having a male on next to discuss how together, men and women can change the future of broadcasting to be more fair, transparent, inclusive, and so on. This was inspired by the story that Jennifer Valentine shared recently. For reference, please check out the last episode. I did record a conversation with a male executive who worked closely with the big personality who was at the center of all this. Unfortunately, listening back to this episode for review, he became uncomfortable with the content being shared. While I understand and respect that decision, I'd like to open this invitation to anyone who's been in broadcast management or dealing with big talent. I would still very much like to have that conversation with a male, and I think it would show allyship as well as bravery and vulnerability, something that women in this business will appreciate. I'll leave that here. Please get in touch, if you'd like to, at womeninmedia.ca. It is Pride Month, and this week also marks National Indigenous Peoples Day in Canada. I can't think of anyone more intriguing to celebrate both of these things. For this episode, I'm going to revisit my conversation with two-spirited Indigenous artist Isque, which was originally published in June 2021. Please note that some may be triggered around the discussion of mass graves being discovered at residential schools. I am Indigenous, so it's always going to be there. It's kind of like if you are a female and making music, how much of being a female is going to be a part of your music? Well, you know, if we're talking about specific references, whether it is you know, related to conversation or visible representation in terms of like art and so forth, then when I first first started, no, those conversations weren't a part of what I was doing. I was in the US and I was um, being very much directed by people that I was working with. And it wasn't, it wasn't there for me at that time, I guess. I was young. I was like, you know, trying to figure things out. Lyrically, is there a a song you remember writing early on in your career or when you first got back to Canada where you really remember confronting any of your Indigenous heritage through song? Absolutely. I have a song called Will I See? And this was the song that really launched my um, dedication to conversation around societal issues impacting Indigenous communities. And this song was written in response to um, the murder of Tina Fontaine, who was a young, young woman, a young Indigenous woman in Winnipeg. And this story really, you know, for lack of better words, broke my heart and my spirit. And it wasn't because she was the first. It's definitely not because she was the last and definitely because she wasn't the first. Um, However, there was, it was almost like the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, Around that time, my sister was either pregnant or like my niece was just born or something like this. Like I, my dates are kind of have kind of escaped me, but it was, you know, it was a really uh, like, it just took me in a different way. And I remember in that moment, it was like, you know, when your eyes open to something, you can't close them again. Yes. And it's not as though my eyes had been closed to what we were experiencing. But like I said, it was that straw that broke the camel's back. So that's, that's what I'm referencing when I say that my eyes opened in a new way. And yeah, it, it absolutely changed my path because I, I couldn't imagine spending my energy talking about anything else anymore. It just was all, all of my heart went to supporting my community. Mm-hmm. All of my love went to supporting my community, my family, my, my loved ones, right? Like this isn't, um, these are, these are stories that are, they're not other people's stories for us. These are our stories. These are, you know, 
These are the things that our loved ones are going through. Tell me a little bit about your Indigenous background. Well, I am Cree and Métis, and my family, so we are um, Métis of the Red River Valley, which is the birthplace of the Métis people. And my family has been there since the dawn of time. <laughs> my mom's <laughs> family anyway. I don't, I don't know too much about my biological dad's family, but so I grew up with my mom and her culture and her family. And well, and then my adopted dad's family. Being from Winnipeg, it's, it's, for me, it's funny whenever I encounter people who have either been to Winnipeg or are from Winnipeg, if it's, if it's a, I've been to Winnipeg, it's a very different conversation. If it's an, I'm from Winnipeg, people are either like, they love it till the death, or they're like, I got out as fast as I could. And for me, I'm in the love it till, to the death category. Like I, I don't know if it's something where it's it's that muscle memory, that DNA memory, but it it's home. My family is all still there. My you know my friends are all still there. Every time I'm there, I go back for big chunks of time. Every time I'm there, it's like a very different sensation than anywhere I've been. I've traveled lots, and I think a very large part of that has to do with the fact that you know, like I said, that's where my my DNA comes from. And growing up in the community back home was was beautiful and difficult and wonderful and all of these things like like any family right yeah. every family has all of those bits and pieces that that um teach you how to love teach you how to protect yourself teach you how to take care of yourself to teach you how to take care of others like i i pulled all of those beautiful pieces from you know being who i am and where i'm from how about siblings? Ah, I have one sister and she is six years younger than I am. She has just had her third child. So I am the proud auntie of three babies and I love them all very, very much. Nice. And she's still in Winnipeg as well. She's a, she's a till death do us part kind. Did you have any experiences growing up um, in Winnipeg where school was tough because of your Indigenous background? Or for the most part, did you have a relatively normal upbringing? Um, yeah, I mean, it was relatively normal. Like, I grew up in a neighborhood that was pretty diverse. So mm -hmm. there were such, there was such a range of kids that when I was in elementary school, it was very, yeah, it was quite diverse. And, and so I didn't really notice, you know, I'm also, you know, like in fairness, I am very white passing. So it's like my experiences as an indigenous person in Winnipeg were dramatically different than a lot of my family members. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like in, in junior high and high school, it was substantially different though where I found that the conversations, you know, I found it hard having, like being friends with a lot of people because by the time I got to high school, it was extremely racist. And, you know, there were so many people who, because that the, when, you know, we all come from different places when it's high school, you didn't, you don't all come from the same neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. And so by the time I got there, there were so many people that were new that didn't know what my background was and assumed I was white. So assumed that I thought like them and, you know, would say really horrible things. And I would have to like pop up from the sidelines and be like, "Bing, hi guys. Uh, just so you know, you are actually talking about my family when you're saying these terrible, terrible things. And, you know, so it was quite alienating a lot of the time, mm -hmm. but for a very different reason than somebody who is not white passing but indigenous because i can walk through those rooms and if nobody knows me they're not going to know what my background is but then i'm also like you know for me i was constantly on defense mode because i was constantly like no don't say that that's shitty let me tell you why this is where you're wrong this is how you're racist and and i was doing that from you know like 15 on 14 on it's quite the responsibility at that age. And I, you know, I think about what people are, what allies are, are starting to do now in, you know, calling out behavior like that and correcting people in the way that ways that they speak um, mm -hmm. at 15. That's like a very different thing to take on. It was actually, it was in grade eight when I first started remember, or when I remember it first starting, it was then it was that year. 
at first it was confusing because you're just like, what are you talking about? Right. Cause like I said, I grew up with diversity. I grew up downtown Winnipeg, right? I grew up with all kinds of different kids and my parents did a very good job at not, you know, like I didn't see it as any difference. I didn't see it as anything, you know, like to me, that was what was normal. You're taught that kind of ignorance. You don't, you don't start off that way. Kids, kids don't look at their friend and are like, my friend is a different skin color. They suck. You mm -hmm. know, like they might notice that they look different, but it's not going to be a better or worse thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. We teach them that. So yeah, like it was, it, yeah, it came when it came and then it just, it just became the, the normal for me, mm -hmm. you know, where I did, I did, you know, like have those conversations all the time. <laughs> yeah. I've asked many people over the last few weeks, like in interviews, whether it be for this podcast or, or just for work, um, there's lots of conversations right now where people are talking about if they learned about residential schools mm -hmm. when they were growing up. Mm -hmm. And I remember learning about that stuff in school and we always had like dedicated units to that, but I've been really surprised to find that a lot of people never even learned about it. Um, what was that situation in Winnipeg? And I'm asking just out of genuine curiosity. Yeah, I don't remember ever learning. I only remember knowing about it because of my family. Through your family, not through the education system. Yeah, I don't recall learning about it in school. I, re I remember learning about like the buffalo jump and pemmican and, <laughs> you know, um, missionaries and black robe. Like we were shown that film in school. Like it was always the Jesuits. Like that was the era that we got, we got first contact, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? That's what we were taught about. And yeah, like I remember, I remember being in grade nine and I had a, a teacher at my high school who was also indigenous and he took us to a pipe ceremony. And I was just like, right on, man. Like he, you know, it, it was, it was awesome. And I, I was so stoked. My mom was so pumped. And then I remember seeing some of the kids and they were just being like such assholes about it, you know? And I'm just like, Ugh. but my teacher was so cool. Like he was just, I don't know. I really admired this man. He was very, um, like he didn't seem phased, but at the same time he gave no space for the ones that were being jerks because we got, we went to the ceremony um, somewhere else. Right. So when we got there, the ones that were, you know, quickly removed anybody that was acting up, but he didn't do it like, he had no pain on his face that I could see, right? And and he and I, like he knew I was indigenous as well. So it was like, it was really nice to see that as a role model for me in how to um, respond when people are, are acting that way, right? Because mm. I don't know what his thoughts were on the inside. I don't know what his heart felt on the inside, but what he showed me was a, an understanding or a patience for somebody else's ignorance that doesn't mean you accept it and ignore it, but it just means that you don't let it in. You don't make it about you. You don't make it about you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And whether or not that's what he was doing, I don't know, but that's what I took from it. Right. Like when I watched him respond, <laughs> he was just so calm and he was really kind and yeah. Is there anyone specific who made you want to get into music indigenous or otherwise? Shoot, yeah. I mean, there there are artists that I absolutely admire, um, who are you know like global phenomenons, um, and you know so artists like Erica Badu, Kate Bush, David Bowie, Bjork. Like these are artists that I really admire. I admire their courage and their freedom in their art, and you know their ability to be themselves and speak their minds, and you know do all the things, mm -hmm. um, more localized. I, you know, I, it was, it came much later on where I started to realize like, wow, people, people have made careers and careers don't necessarily mean fame and stardom and millions and millions of dollars. And those, you know, like those were the artists like Kenny Starr that were extremely influential for me because I was like, oh man, like she's had a, incredible career and is still like just a very normal person <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I mean that in the best way right like she's not normal but she's like you know her life is chill is what mm -hmm. i mean 
Yeah, she can still have like a good quality of life, like not living on a tour bus or. Exactly. Who who has like mentored you uh, in terms of your career as an artist? Oh gosh, I've had so many. Well, Kinney was a big mentor for me. Absolutely. Nice. We've had, yeah. She's also a dear friend, but it, it did begin in the mentorship role, which was which was awesome and awesome that she's so humble to start off in that position and then befriend, you know, someone, someone in the likes of me. But yeah, so she was a, a huge mentor for me. I, you know, somebody who's done a lot for me and for indigenous music in general is Alan Gray Eyes in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. He's, um, he's such a champion for our people and our voices and our music. And I think that I'd, I personally don't feel that there's any indigenous musician in Canada that couldn't um, associate mass progress in their careers because of that man. He is amazing, yeah. yeah. In this day and age, what does it take for you to feel empowered as a musician, but also as a woman in the spotlight? I've learned to Number one, turn off social media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is, I was just like, Woof, that is not the place for me anymore. And that was probably the biggest place of empowerment for me was just that disconnecting. And, and it's kind of like, you know, when you're in an abusive relationship and you finally get out of it and you're like, it's really, really, really hard. And you go through this period of total de devastation. And then you come out the other side and you're like, oh, Oh, I can breathe and I'm not afraid to breathe. This is an assumption I'm making, but it sounds like uh, part of that empowerment comes from not worrying about what others think. Exactly. Yeah. And I haven't been one to worry about what others think in my lifetime, right? Like I've always been the one that will put myself first in terms of, you know, be the one to stand up for somebody else and be the one to take the hit first. I've been a little bit almost like blind to that you know, where, where I will put myself in that position because I feel very passionate about the things that I'm passionate about. And, but then it was like, when it came to this, it just, it, it, and, and that, you know, the fear that develops, I'm like, this isn't me. Why am I so worried about this? This is not, this is not me because I, you know, the things that I, how I conduct myself in my life is quite thought out. You know, I'm an Aquarius. For those of you who don't know zodiac signs, maybe you don't care. Maybe you're really into it. I don't know. I'm into it. Aquarians are quite introspective. We spend a lot of time thinking about things and thinking about, you know, like our interactions. And then, you know, like when we're done with something, we go home and we think about it. Like we're just very, very much in our heads. And in our heads, in the clouds. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's, for me, it was like, where, how did this happen? How did I become this person that was like almost too too invested in what somebody else was going to think about me? And I'm like, nope, not for me. Nope. Okay, what are what are the other tools that go along with that for empowerment? Age, I think is is one. I've been, I recently turned forty, and when I was in Los Angeles, I can't tell you how many times people told me to lie about my age, pretend I was younger, never never admit blah, 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 you know, and all of those pieces. And I was just like, what? Like, no, thank you. Um, so for me, age and, and ex you know, like accepting age as it comes is very empowering. It's challenging, <laughs> especially when you're like, oh gosh, where did all of these gray hairs come from? Or where did these wrinkles come from or whatever, right? Like, and I don't, you know, I don't consider myself old, but just the, the fact that, as you grow, you age, you change, you learn, you develop, you all of those things. To me, it was like, all of it is beautiful. And I can't, I can't only get wiser. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's other parts of aging as well. And so for me, accepting that and the comfort that I found in that was a very empowering position to take in my being, and then in my art. Mm -hmm. I definitely feel far more liberated in my art this year than I have in any other year of my life. And I, you know, all I can attribute it to is that acceptance of like, I hit this milestone and, and I'm cool with it. Mm -hmm. And that You're completely just, comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. And then from there, it's like, eh, you know, and now I don't, you know, like, 
and people can say what they want to say and like, whatever. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to go forward in my life knowing that my heart is always in a good place and that I'm always concerned and thinking, but I also have to be true to myself. Mm -hmm. Just like everybody should. Has there been a moment where you have had to push back or fight for your identity in artistic direction? What's a moment that you really persevered through that and came out in a place where you were so proud of yourself? With my song, Night Danger, I, I feel this was a song that I wrote. I had, this is one where I had a total vision for the tune. To date, it's a song that I'm most proud of because it is such a reflection of me. And I had to fight for that song. I had to fight for that song like so in every single way. You know, I worked with a team and it was like all dudes and so many times people wanted to change it and send it in a different direction or take credit for things they didn't do. But then also I had to really fight for it because it's a song where I say the F-bomb 500 times in it. And so it was like, well, this will never make it on the radio and this will never blah, 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 make it to playlists and da, 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 da. And I'm like, I don't care. And yeah, so I really, I really had to fight for that one. And, you know, I, I feel so good about it because every time I hear it back, I'm like, man, that's a good song. How comfortable has it been for you to uh, use, you know, your, your platforms to speak about those indigenous conversations to speak about, you know, I know that you're participating in some pride uh, events <laughs> and I would love to hear a little more about that, but how easy is it for you to speak like as a two spirited person? Very easy. Yeah. It's for me, it's, um, I was lucky enough to grow in a household that was very much in support of my being. You know, they, my family was, I'm a, you know, I come from a family of artists and, you know, um, strong women and, and my grandfather was a huge influence in my life and they were all very encouraging of me being me. Um, you know, so even though they'll tease me about, you know, my mom has this thing, like if I didn't get my way or the, the house that they, my parents live in is a bungalow in the main floor. It's like the kitchens in the back and the living rooms in the front. And there's two hallways. It's kind of like a, a track, a race track. <laughs> and okay. so my mom loves to tell this story about how, um, if I, you know, if I wanted something and they said, no, I would like go and do laps and like plan my attack to come back and reconvince them. And if they'd say, no, can I go and do another lap? They thought it was hilarious, but it also was, a, it's a big part of my spirit now, right? Like that developing that ability to plan out my, what I had to say, right? Cause I wasn't, I didn't go in and just like whine. I would go in and, you know, like, and be like, okay, here, here are the reasons why I think you should change your mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so because they were so gentle with me in that, I think that really nurtured my ability to be true to who I am and speak my mind about the things that I speak about. I also grew up in a family that, you know, when I came out to my mom, um, she was, she was like, cause I was like, nervous about it right so when I told her I was just like oh yeah like I've got something to say and uh, I feel kind of nervous she's like what is it and then I told her and she's like that's it <laughs> I'm like what and she's like come on and she really gave me a good lesson because I was being I was so caught up in myself and maybe I had heard other people's stories that I forgot how much work other family members of mine had done in our family to create a space of safety for other types of people, right? Yeah. Like I've got cousins who are queer, I've got cousins who are trans, I've got cousins who are every shade of the rainbow. And so I went into it being like, Ugh. and my mom's like, get over yourself. They already did all of the work for this family, right? So it was, it was a good humbling lesson for me. And, and, you know, so I think that was what I also brought forward is that, you know, my family, my, I have family members who did so much of that work so that I didn't have to. So for me, it's like, it's important to speak about things because, you know, we place ourselves, we have this teaching of seven generations where you are right in the middle of the generations before you and the generations that come after you. And you are a result of them and you will be a part of the future, right? And and that was what I had thought of when I was in that moment. It's like, 
of course, right? Like I have all of these generations of family members who have done all of this work, both when it comes to culture, when it comes to sexuality, gender, um, gender fluidity, all of these, mm -hmm. all of these sections of being that for me, it was like, now it's my job to, I don't have to fight that in my family right? That's not my job. My job is to now be strong and present these conversations out in the world as a pillar of strength in it, knowing that my family has my back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a genuine question, because I don't know any better. Um, mm -hmm. What's the two spirited story in indigenous teachings? And is it the same across the board? Or is it different in certain communities? It's going to be different in in different communities. I know that the term was coined in Winnipeg at a conference in 1990 something okay let me actually just google that because it's so interesting that it was coined at a conference mm -hmm. that's not what i was expecting held in winnipeg in 1990 yeah yeah okay it was, so it was... to elder myra laramie who proposed its use during the third annual intertribal native american first nations gay and lesbian american conference held in winnipeg 1990. the term is a translation of the anishinaabe moen term which I can't say, I don't speak this language, but which means two spirits. When do you remember using that term, like two-spirited for the first time? Ooh, like outwardly? Yeah. Um, when I was in my first like formal relationship with a other, uh, with another two-spirit person. It was uh, like I had, I had been in, I had had romances with women. You know, funny for me, here's my, here's my story on this. Um, I also did not, like, it took me a long time to understand myself in that because, again, I didn't have any references to people that were like me growing up. The, the women who were in relationships with women were all very physically identifiable in a way that I didn't identify with. And so for me, it was like, I don't get this. This is, this isn't, you know, like that, if that's a lesbian, quote unquote, that's not what I see in myself. I don't, I don't relate. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so it wasn't until I moved to Los Angeles that I was like, oh, like women can be all kinds of different types of women and still be interested in women, or they can be, you know, and, and that's actually when I started to understand and learn about the term two spirit as well, right? Like, so, you know, if it came into fruition in the, in 1990, like became kind of stamped as a, as a marker, um, you know, I was nine, <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, for me, it came later on in life. Like I just, and then in hindsight, I look back and I'm like, oh yes, like this friend of mine that I had at such and such age, I was like, oh no, I actually had like a massive crush on that person, but I didn't understand what it was. So I, you know, like I, nothing happened because I just, you know, like you're a kid and you don't know or whatever. That was, that was my journey in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a, like a two part question. All right. Bring it. You're just getting all the goods on me today, Sarah. <laughs> Holy. Uh, it's not my fault. You're one of the most interesting people. Just getting all loose lipped on my water. That's all. That's all you. <laughs> what has been one of your proudest moments in regards to being two spirited, whether it was someone who heard some of your music and really identified with like lyrical content or uh, something where you've publicly said something that someone's really identified with? Hmm. Um, because there's a there's a lot of difficult stories about this type of stuff. And I, I want to make sure we talk about like those moments we can celebrate too, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, oddly enough, my proudest moment was not my own. It was my younger cousin. And we were having a conversation one day and I had been, I was already in a, a relationship with a two-spirited person and I, you know, was very comfortable like there was, you know, I had no uh, hesitation. There was, like I said, my, when my, when I had that conversation with my mom, it really just launched me into this headspace of like, get over yourself. This isn't, mm -hmm. you know, like that's not your journey or your fight. Um, and so I remember having a conversation with my younger cousin who really just, cause I was just like, you know, I, I didn't really know how to identify these term, this term doesn't fit. That term doesn't fit. Like, because there's always sort of, bits and pieces of it that I don't fully understand or don't fully relate to myself. 
And my cousin was like, well, I just love who I love. Yeah. And I went, of course, you know? And so for me, that was actually the most proud moment that I felt and it wasn't mine. It was my cousin sharing that sentiment and me going like, here, of course, and learning it from the younger ones, right? Like the, the, the younger, the younger generations always have such vast amounts of knowledge and you're just like, where does that come from? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's almost like, uh, knowing, knowing that the younger cousin didn't have those same reservations that you did when you were first telling your mom. Not at all. That's beautiful. Not at all. Yeah. And, and yeah. So for me, that was it. I don't know that, you know, like I haven't, I haven't really written too much about, sexuality so mm-hmm. for me that hasn't been a part of the conversations that i have in my music in general and any co- time there's been conversation about sentiment it usually is you know like i have a song on on my last album about a f- very dear friend of mine who passed away from cancer so it's like you know funny enough in terms of this conversation this album that i'm recording right now is very much the polar opposite it is all about my personal experiences my personal loves my personal lusts like all of that kind of stuff so it is deeply deeply personal and private except for i'm putting into an album that i will release to the world (laughs) but up until now the conversations have generally been quite community focused right Mm -hmm. and or and or focused on you know something that is um, a little easier for me to to step back from right like it's always my heart in it but when there's so many voices a part of the song it's easier to to hug everybody in it and be like this is our story this is us mm-hmm. I'm sharing a you know like my interpretation of our story or yeah. Okay, now talk to me about one of your proudest songs in terms of showcasing your Indigenous identity. So I wrote a song called Nobody Knows, and this song was, again, in response to missing and murdered Indigenous women on a big scale. So while Will I See was about that specific finding and that specific experience of... um, you know, when, when they found Tina and Winnipeg came together and it, you know, it was very much my interpretation of her speaking back to us, right? Mm -hmm. Something in that kind of space. Nobody Knows was a song that I wrote about, it was very angry and afraid. You know, I was afraid for my niece. I was afraid for my family members, my loved ones, my friends my community members, and I was angry. And I wrote that song from that place for all of us, right? For mm-hmm. all of us, because we've all had that conversations with our mothers or our aunties of how to protect ourselves, how to walk differently across the street, how to know what's around us. You know, like when you walk into a room, I know where it's been ingrained into me. I know, like, this is going to be really dark, but like, when as a kid or as a teenager, I knew where, you know, a beer bottle was at a party in case I needed it, right? Mm-hmm. Like to, to at all times, like things like that, you just, you're taught to know this and it's, it's dark and it's heavy, but this is our truth, right? And so that song was very cathartic to sing because I was able to package all of that rage into one piece and scream it on stage. And I remember being at a festival, it was a pride festival, ironically enough, in New uh-huh. Westminster, BC, just outside of Vancouver, or like a, a, a suburb of Vancouver. And there was this beautiful, strong indigenous woman standing at the front of the stage. I'd never performed there before. So I was brand new, had like very small audience because I was new to the area. I was new to the scene or newish to the scene, that kind of thing. But she came and stood directly in front of the stage when I played that song and sang with me every single word. And I was just like, fuck yeah. And that was just, you know, like, I, in, by the end of it, I was crying because it was crying from like that, you know, not like sobbing, but like that, that place of like, ugh, why do we have to scream this? Mm-hmm. Exhaustion, right? Just like 
like this is for us this is for our loved ones and we're we don't want to do that we don't i don't want to have to be on stage screaming about this stuff i don't want to have to be having these conversations all the time nobody does Mm -hmm. i imagine that the last few weeks has been exhausting for you too Uh, you know i think it was uh was Donna Mero, that conversation that we had, I think, I think I saw that you joined us for that conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he said to me when we talked earlier that week, we were on the phone and uh, he said, I keep getting these calls, like, and it, it's hard not to feel like I'm being reached out to as like a token Indigenous person, mm-hmm. even though I really want to help have the space to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, did you find any of that over the last few weeks? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I just didn't respond to most of them. No, now's not the time. (laughs) Yeah. And for for the most part, you know, these are things that you you've been thinking about your whole life, right? Well, exactly. And, and to me, it's like, you know, and this is the thing, it's like, I had an interview earlier where I was talking about albums, you know, music projects. And then of course the conversation ends up going there. And, and, and the, you know, the question of, whether I felt it was my responsibility as an indigenous person and an artist to talk about it. And I'm like, no, I think it's my responsibility to talk about this because I'm a human being, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is, this is everybody's problem. These are mass graves of children. This is genocide. This is not something that is an indigenous person's problem or Mm -hmm. responsibility to solve. Like that idea in itself is like, switch that immediately. If you can't, if somebody can't, can't see a mass grave of children and not need to know what their race is or their culture is, but just see that they're children, mm-hmm. that's the first, that's it. That's where it ends. Right. So simply put, but you're bang on. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's mm-hmm. how it is for me if you're in control of the conversation yourself and it's not dependent on anyone else or any interview, Mm -hmm. um, what are the ways that you want to uplift the indigenous community with your art? I just, you know, I strive to, I strive to be a good person every day. I strive to be better than I was yesterday. Every day I strive to walk with love and talk with love, receive with love, give with love. Um, and to be true to my art and to show others that those things are possible right Mm -hmm. uh we all have we're not all the same like you know people who are indigenous are not all the same we all have very different stories and i find it can be tiring and difficult to be for the assumption to constantly be made that we all just you know like have this blanket understanding of each other but we don't, mm-hmm. right? We're all very diverse. We have different languages. We have different cultures. We have different histories and stories. And, you know, like some some families went to residential schools, some did not. Some families were torn apart during the 60s scoop. Some were not. Some are, you know, like we have all of these different, different narratives, right? And so I just, For me, it's what I hope is that I can just be myself and I can share my truth and I can be comfortable to share my truth and show people that that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but it's okay. You know, I'm so intrigued and want to learn more about like indigenous uh, traditions and cultures. What's like a a tradition from, from your family that, you know, you wish that other people could learn about? For me, it is the the thing that I loved the most that I got from my mom was honoring honoring the spirit of things. And so we have a custom where you put down tobacco. If you're going to take from the earth, you put down tobacco to, th- to th- say thanks, whether it is picking plants, whether it is hunting, whatever it might be, right? Like if you're going to receive something from this earth, you have to give thanks. And the way that I was taught, we were taught was to, by putting tobacco down, you're honoring the spirit of whatever it is that you're receiving. And, and I think that in, for me, that's one that I, you know, I'm a firm believer in it. It really is a part of my everyday with how disrespectful people have been of the earth. This sounds like a tradition that's very 
it, it helps you be aware of what you receive from yeah. the world. Exactly. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not a perfect being. I am filled with imperfections and I am filled with, um, what's the word? Biases, not biases. You're a hypocrite sometimes. Exactly. You know, like there's no perfect being, but that teaching is still with me all the time. And I, I refer back to it. Right. So it's like, even so simple as, you know, going out to pick medicine as an example, right? It's a nice thing to be able to say that you're connecting, you know, this thing that's going to be healing your body, you're going to give thanks for it. I take it so far as if I'm ever cooking fish or I'm not a big meat eater, so really it's going to be fish, but I'll, as I'm washing the fish before I cook it, I, in my mind or sometimes out loud, I'll just say thank you. And it's not because I'm like, wanting to be cosmic or anything like this. It's literally because I'm grateful for the fact that I'm going to be eating this animal that, or this creature that was alive at one point. And I think it's important to recognize that, to recognize that life feeds life. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's so many cycles and, and um, evolutions and whatnot. And to pretend they don't exist is, is what is so dangerous for us. And for mm -hmm. our existence, because like, let's let get us real. where we are now. Yeah, Mother Earth is going to kick us off this planet before she dies. As mentioned on the last episode, I've had many guests that are celebrating Pride this month. Please refer to Women in Media Pod socials for some of those episodes, and thank you for listening once again. A woman of ill repute is a person who's found success in non-traditional ways, uh, often risking the disapproval of society. They're usually fearless, and more often than not, they're quite funny. They're certainly interesting and sometimes inspirational. I'm Maureen Holloway, and along with my friend, noted broadcaster Wendy Besley, we talk to these women on our podcast, and we call it Women of Ill Repute. You might like it. Lots of people do. And all you have to do is listen on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or you could go to our website at womenofillrepute.com. That's kind of our online home. And while you're there, it wouldn't hurt you to sign up for our newsletter. I'm just saying. Another Sound Off Media Company podcast.